Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant, along with Chad Young, also another guest to join us very soon here. Hope you had a great weekend. Lots going on for you. A beautiful weekend here in the East. A lot going on today, too, so don't, don't get lazy on me. So just a bit of the prosecution closing argument there in the Florida versus Nicole Nachman case. With me here, Chad Young, attorney from just down the street, as a matter of fact, here in Manhattan. Let me ask you this first. What, what, what do you, what's your general take on the verdict? Surprised, et cetera. I was not surprised. I thought the jury uh, got this one spot on. As I was listening to the prosecution closing argument, the one thing I kept wanting him to say was, yes, this may have been a bad mother, but she was not on trial to determine whether or not she was a good or a bad mother. But just because you may believe she wasn't the best mother in the world, it did not deserve death. And when the prosecutor got up to do his closing rebuttal, that is exactly what he said. I thought it was spot on. I thought the jury got this one right. Yeah, you know, uh, let me ask you, Lakai. I mean, uh, certainly she wasn't mommy dearest in, in any sense. But can you really blame what happened to Nicole in her childhood? Let's just start with the battered child uh, self-defense. I didn't hear about any battering. I mean, give me your take on that defense. I agree with you, Michael. I don't think that there was enough there. And I think that is why the jury decided the way that they did. There wasn't a history of abuse by this mother. There were certainly some challenges within their relationship. But I don't think that it calculated to abuse and it was enough to justify the killing of her mother. Yeah, I did a little bit of research, not exhaustive, but a little bit. And I, I couldn't find one case in which a battered spouse or battered child self-defense was put forward where there wasn't any violence. So this would have been groundbreaking if the jury had bitten on this. Okay, let's take a listen now to some of the defense closing where they kind of lay out this as one of their arguments. So it sounds to me like you have to believe that it's physical abuse by liposuction, physical abuse by uh, telling your kid they should get uh, laser corrective surgery. Lakai, um, again, I, I know the defense is doing the best they can with what they've got, and they're suggesting that these these issues arose to the level of, you know, a physical battering, that each time the mom would say to Nicole, you should do these things to better yourself, it was like taking a bat to her. Uh, would anybody buy that? You know, it was certainly a creative argument. I think that they did exactly what they were supposed to do because they didn't have a lot to hang their hat on. So I think that they did a good job. However, I don't think it was enough. And so I think, again, that's why the jury decided that she was guilty. You know, I want to ask you this, Chad, because there wasn't a question from the jury during the course of deliberations, and it had to do with uh, the, the uh, issue of premeditation, and, and it made me wonder where they were hung up. You know, was it the murder of the stepdad? Was it the murder of mom? Because each fact pattern is a little bit different. You know, we know that Nicole went from the school to home, killed Bob, then went back to the school, then came back and waited for mom, and then when mom got there, there's some evidence that suggests that Nicole tried to leave the scene and that only because her mom kind of confronted her as she was trying to leave did she, the mom, get killed. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the situation you just described, which is, came out through testimony in the trial, is probably where the jury may have had their problem. Uh, if she abandoned her plan that she originally had and then ended up killing her mother because of the confrontation, there could be an element there that, you know, her premeditation plan had been broken. She initiated another sort of emergency on the spot plan. Um, I mean, we don't know. We yeah, weren't in those jury I, 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 like, I like where you're going. Yeah, I think that's kind of what they may have had a trouble with because with Bob, it seemed pretty straightforward. Showed up in the house, bang, dead. Right. Okay. We're going to talk much more about this case and others here on the Long Crime Network, but right now, a bit of a break. Stay right where you are. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, I will give Dr. Ewing this. He's the defense expert trying to establish that uh, Nicole was schizophrenic, therefore insane at the time of the killings. He said those things with a straight face, uh, that, uh, you know, he, he believes that the defendant felt her mom would kill her if she found out about the, you know, the bicycle and not getting the housing arranged at the college. I mean, come on. Uh, Chad Young here with me on set. You know, that's a phrase that you would hear probably most kids say about their parents. My mom's going to kill me if blah, blah, blah. It's not going to be really she's going to kill me. This doctor had to make it sound like she feared for her life. Yeah, and where was the evidence to support that? 
we heard evidence that the mom would scold her, the mom wasn't that loving, the mom put pressure on her, but we never heard any evidence in this trial that the mom was violent in any way, ever threatened to kill her in any way, or ever gave her a reason to form that opinion. You know, Lakai, I, I think the better argument was the schizophrenia, you know, insanity argument because at least there's some evidence that Nicole heard voices, heard screams at or about the time she was going to kill her father, her stepfather, and her mom. What do you think about that defense? Well, I think it was great considering that, again, all that they had. I think there's no question that there is some mental illness involved. The question is whether or not that's enough to allow her to justify the killing of her parents. I don't think it was. I don't think the fact that she heard voices was enough to justify that she killed the both of them. So I think the jury got it right. You know what I think really happened here, if you get through all the weeds, is I think the insanity defense saved this woman's life, this young girl's life, because the death penalty was on the table early on, and then the state decided at some point in the process, eh, we're not going to seek the death penalty. And, and I believe that's truly because they felt it would be harder for the jury to recommend death for somebody that's clearly struggling with some sort of mental or emotional issues. So the, uh, the expert testimony continued during the trial, and you just heard the defense expert, so obviously the prosecution's got their own side. And you're going to see a familiar face here. This is Emily Lazaro. She was the expert for the defense in the John Johnchuk case. Well, she's swap sides. She's for the prosecution rebutting the defense in this case. So Emily Lazaro back on the stand there in this case uh, helping the prosecution poke holes in the defense dis defense defense that uh, this uh, this Nicole Nachman was somehow insane at the time that she killed her stepfather and her mother. So Chad Young um, it seemed to me this witness does a great job of just kind of pointing out the flaws in the defense analysis. Yeah great expert. Um, she couldn't get uh, stumped on her opinion. Uh, she was able to sort of uh, go with the flow of the question and give a very responsive response, if you will. Uh, great job by this expert. Yeah, I think so. And look, I, she's been on before. We've seen her before in more controversial scenarios than this. Um, you know, when you put on a witness like this, I have to tell you, I think the facts were so strong for the prosecution, not that hard, but, uh, you know, w could you have done any more with this witness than the prosecution did? I think that, first of all, she builds credibility with the jury. She's testified on behalf of the defense in another case, and now she's for the prosecution. So it doesn't look like she's a hired gun, and she'll testify in accordance with whoever's paying her. So I think that establishes credibility at the front line. Secondly, I think that there was nothing more that they could have done with this witness. She certainly pokes holes in the defense expert's testimony about the fact that she wasn't prompted to do this because she was in fear of her life. She was only in fear of being killed after her mother found out about the fact that she killed her stepfather. Yeah, that, that definitely makes it more believable when you say, my mom's going to kill me. Uh, yeah, because I just killed her husband, my stepfather. That I'm buying. Okay, well, ultimately, no sale on the insanity defense, no sale on the battered child self-defense, and Nicole Nachman found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. No death penalty on the table, so there was would be no sentencing phase here. She was uh, you know, had the cuffs slapped on and hauled her away at his life without the possibility of parole automatically when the death penalty is off the table. So that's it for N Nicole Nachman. We are going to come back here in just a couple of moments, though, and talk to you about a case that's uh, going on out in California. We're covering things coast to coast here. The Hollywood Ripper trial. It is nearing completion, and we're going to bring you up to speed on that case when we come right back. This is the Long Crime Network.